thank you for joining us today for the Planets World Day uh, webinar session. Uh, we are very pleased to have today uh, two very uh, famous uh, people from the from the wine world, uh, Robert Joseph and uh, Polly Hammond. And uh, as a main moderator of this session is our very good friend uh, Thomas Brandel. Uh, thank you, Thomas, uh, for all your efforts that you are doing for us. Um, our uh, session that is starting now is uh, under the topic uh, digitalization of wine sales and best ma marketing practice for uh, promoting local varieties uh, worldwide. So uh, we all know that the wine industry uh, has become more and more co competitive, especially in the, uh, in, in the past decade. So with uh, an annual uh, wine production of more than 1 million uh, different wine labels, uh, winemakers actually struggle to different uh, themselves. So once the viticulture boom uh, was international varieties, now uh, we, are, uh, we are increasingly re returning actually to the source and looking for the greatest possible uh, distinction as uh, the key uh, that will open uh, the door for the new market. Uh, so we are aware that the wine consumers are demanding uh, something special, something different, uh, which can be found in the native, uh, less known uh, wine varieties that each region can offer. Uh, so uh, I will give floor now to Thomas uh, to start officially this, uh, this panel and um, see you at the end with the question and uh, answer session. Go ahead, Thomas. Yeah, thank you very much, dear Elena. Uh, hello to everybody. We are very happy to have uh, you with us today. Uh, maybe we should start with a short introduction of us three on the panel here. My name, as you have seen, is Thomas Brandl. I'm a Stuttgart-based German journalist and PR expert with uh, global experience in the wine field uh, for about 20 years now. I'm a member in many wine competitions, jury member in wine competitions all around the world. And I must say, Elena mentioned it already, uh, Southeastern Europe has become a little bit my, my favorite playground in the last 10 years, I could say, uh, traveling around a lot there because I think there's so many interesting things to discover there. So this is about my background. Now I would pass to Polly. Polly, uh, before you present yourself, uh, to say it with Manu Chao, with the singer Manu Chao, que hora es? <laughs> What's the time in Auckland, New Zealand at the moment? We just passed 1 a.m. So <laughs> thank you, Thomas, and thank you, Elena, um, for bearing with me. If there are a few yawns that sneak into this discussion tonight, it is not boredom, but rather a bit of um, jet lag that's kicking in. So, so I'm actually thrilled to be here. Um, I, Robert and I have had quite the past few months together with the work that we do. I am the founder and managing director of a agency that works with wine brands around the world, Five Forest, to help them adapt to digital and to understand how to do digital right and make money from digital. It's as simple as that. Thanks very much, Robert. You should unmute. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll just please. Thank you. So my background is as was as a consumer journalist, uh, both in newspapers and magazines. I also started the International Wine Challenge and I'm involved with Mundus Vini competition these days and I see Thomas at various competitions. Um, but over the last 15 years, I've been making wine in the south of uh, southwest of France in Languedoc and also doing consultancy um, for various wine regions and wine companies. And I've worked for Georgia and I've worked for Moldova. So I've seen quite a lot of what's been happening in, in Eastern Europe and Southeastern Europe. And I have, uh, I think, quite different views possibly to the ones I used to have when I was a consumer journalist. I also write uh, every week and online and also every issue of Mining Goes Wine Business International. And that gives me an opportunity to look at the world of wine globally. And recently, Polly Hammond and I have been working on both a series on YouTube called The Real Business of Wine and with some consultancies for various wine producers. 
Great, thank you very much, Robert. Uh, I was asked to give, especially for, for the people, for the audience from outside the Balkans, some key facts and figures about uh, Macedonia as a country, or now I have to say North Macedonia, to be correct, you all remember the dispute uh, the country was having with the Greek neighbors. Finally, uh, their new country's name now is North Macedonia. And uh, the figures I want to give to you, not everybody will know. There's about 2 million inhabitants. That's not very much. Uh, almost 29 hectares of vineyards, 38% uh, of that planted with Vranets grapes. Uh, in Vranets production, uh, Macedonia, North Macedonia is number one in the world in front of countries like Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Kosovo and Montenegro, where the black stallion uh, originally comes from. Um, Macedonia has a hot and dry climate. It's uh, ideally suited to produce bold red wines like Branets. Many mountains above 2000 meters altitude, a uh, dry, hot climate. Uh, the former Yugoslavian Republic was well known as the source of uh, bulk wine, of course, to help, I would say, to stay in the stallion picture. Um, to help the lighter red wines in the northern states to get on the horse. And uh, things have changed tremendously, especially during the last 20 or even more, the last uh, 10 years. Thanks to wines of Macedonia and a lot of work and investment in the roughly 80 wineries existing nowadays, uh, things have changed and uh, Macedonia is shifting more, north, north Macedonia to be correct, is shifting more and more into quality wine production. Between 2009 and 2019, means within 10 years, the bulk wine share of exports has decreased from 88 to 57% in volume, whereas bottled wines increased their export share in value from 36 to 55%. Bag in, bo bag in box accounts for 6%, meanwhile, bulk wine for 40%. So this is a tremendous change. Also interesting to know is that 48% of the export volume goes in the meantime to EU countries, followed by the Balkans with 40%. Also, this is very interesting to know. In fact, uh, to finish, the total export share of production of North Macedonia wineries is 85%. describe their image. Maybe we start with Robert this time. I'm afraid I lost a little bit. Um, I lost the question. I didn't hear your question. I'm yeah. afraid. Can you hear me now? I can now. Okay. The question was, which are your personal experiences with Macedonian wines so far? And how, would you, how would you describe their image? I've tasted a number of, of, of wines from Macedonia um, over the years and particularly in recent times, and I've seen the improvement in, in quality. Um, I think that I would be very, I'll be very frank in everything I say, which is to say that most consumers have very little uh, awareness of uh, North Macedonia or Macedonia, whichever it's, it's in name, um, but they have very little awareness of Moldova. Um, indeed, they have little awareness outside the region, even of Bulgaria, Romania, and other countries in Eastern Europe. And I think we also have to be frank in saying that Eastern European countries, and indeed Southern Europe, still suffer from reputation uh, the reputations they had 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, either people are of a certain age where they remember uh, wines from the Soviet era, which would be people over 50 years old, for example, and or they're, they're younger and they just don't know them. However, thanks partly to the success of places like Georgia and of a few producers in places like Slovenia, we're beginning to see a new generation of wine interested people, of enthusiasts, who, um, as uh, Elena was saying earlier, have a great interest in knowing more about wine and discovering new things. And this runs to me in parallel with the beer, the craft beer story, if you like, and craft spirits, where you have people who are going out, or indeed coffee, uh, chocolate, who are going out and they want to drink or to eat, to consume different things. 
but we need to be very aware that those people form a minority of the of the audience. Thank you very much. Polly, what is your opinion? Yeah, I tend to agree with Robert on that. Um, I, I think that a key issue that we have to address, and so I would like to first say that living in New Zealand, I exemplify the many people who hear or read about but simply cannot access a lot of the wines that we're we would be talking about today. So, um, so we have to acknowledge the market issues uh, in regard to your distribution models. Um, so that having been said, I think that we also need to be extremely aware of championing the very best wine that we can possibly produce because when we are trying to break out into new markets, we must lead with the most solid representation. And, um, and, and I think that that's something that when we are looking at the reporting about it and the expectations from say a new consumer like myself, that that's what I'm expecting from the experience is that by the time something reaches me down here in New Zealand, that I'm going to have the most perfect example of your North Macedonian wines that I can possibly experience. Thank you very much. Uh, it's World Vranets Day today, so we should talk a little bit about grape varieties, I'd say. Uh, Eastern European countries have a huge heritage of indigenous grape varieties, but some of them, for example, Bulgaria, Moldova, you know very well, Robert, uh, or the Ukraine, they focus strongly on the international grape varieties in the last decades, what concerns plantations. Was that very clever, Polly? Talk to how they marketed it and how much they money how much money they had to do it. Um, so, I I think that we take a risk and mind you that I am the marketing geek in the room, right? So I am not the wine journalist. I'm the person who gets paid to help wine sell it. Um, and I think that we run a risk when we look toward legacy brands or when we look toward what other, um, what other possibly competitors, other producers have done, because while there are lessons that we can take away from them, wine has a history of making decisions based upon what everybody else in the wine world has done. And if one thing we've learned through digital marketing and communication in the past five years, it has been that our users don't want the same experience. Our, our consumers, our visitors, the people who are engaging with our brand, they don't want to relive an experience that someone else has already done. So my answer is not about, was it the right path to go indigenous or to go um, established grapes, but more, is it the right path to base our decisions on what someone else has done or do we actually need to look at how we market and present our own strengths, because that's the key thing. Don't try to assume somebody else's model to market our strengths and to whom and, to, and how. Thank you, Robert. Um, I, yes, I'm going to take a slightly different view. Um, I agree with quite a lot of that, but I think that we, we also um, have to, and I think Polly mentioned this earlier, there is the issue of distribution. It's all very well. You as a journalist, Thomas, me as a journalist, we don't distribute wine. We talk about wine. Wine gets distributed either by big supermarkets or by small, by restaurants, sommeliers, by carvies. We need to know who is going to distribute and how is the wine going to be distributed. Is it, to Polly's point, going to be distributed digitally? Historically, that's not been the case. That's increasingly going to be the case. And we've seen it more since COVID-19. People have been buying more wine online. But if you put an ordinary consumer in London or New York in front of a wall of wine in the supermarket, the average consumer's hand does not reach for a grape they've never heard of. And for that reason, if you've been in Moldova, you've been planting uh, grapes, actually it's easier to sell Pinot Noir or Cabernet Sauvignon to that supermarket in America than it's been to sell Fetiasca or Rara Niagara. 
And if you haven't had the marketing money and skills to talk to people and to get to make them want the Fetiaska Niagara or Rara Niagara, or unless you've got, or indeed uh, Vranets for, from Macedonia, unless you have the way of finding out who is the person who is most likely to buy this, you are going to struggle. So to me, you, it depends what you're doing. If you want to sell wine easily, you do sell to people what they want to buy. If you want to open a restaurant anywhere in the world, you open a burger bar and you will find people want to buy burgers, but you're going to be competing with a lot of other burger bars. If on the other hand, you want to open an Ethiopian menu restaurant, you've got to be in a street somewhere where there'll be the kind of people who want to try Ethiopian food rather than buy a burger. Mm -hmm. But um... If we are talking, for example, about a country like Georgia, you know Georgia very well, so do mm -hmm. I, um, a country which followed the indigenous path, what concerns uh, grape varieties, it seems to be clearly in front of other ones, which uh, means international awareness in terms of international awareness, or am I wrong? I think it's very, very dangerous to treat Georgia as a model. Nobody is suggesting that the world should plant Ricazzatelli, which is, a, a, to me, it's, a, it's actually a very ordinary grape variety. Um, Saparavi is much more interesting, and there is some, some potential there. But Georgia has succeeded because of the story of the Kvevri, the Amphora, the history. It's, it's, it's had a little magic, and it's a very small production country. And it has actually found a little niche in the market. But Turkey, for example, has spent a lot of money on trying to promote its indigenous grapes and the similar kind of history to Georgia, and it hasn't really succeeded. And Greece has a whole range of wonderful indigenous grapes, and it's been trying for a very long time. So for everybody in Eastern Europe to say, or anywhere in the world to say, I can be another Georgia, I think is, is just as dangerous or more dangerous to my mind than saying I'm going to plant Cabernet Sauvignon because they have it in France and California. Um, so what would you recommend? Uh, what could be the way for a country like uh, North Macedonia? Not follow the Georgian example, I understood that very well, but what would be your recommendation for a country like Northern Macedonia? Polly? <laughs> Um, okay, so coming from New Zealand, I think that we have uh, a really great example of what historically a small country can do to pull together and, um, and establish itself in the global market. Um, I don't pretend to have been a part of that. That was before my days in New Zealand, but certainly living here and being a part of this wine industry, there are a lot of lessons to take away. So What should we do? Um, the very first thing that I want to encourage anyone who's listening today to do is to establish a model that is collaborative as opposed to competitive, because as a unit, you can accomplish far more than you can as individual parts. So the expression, uh, the expression, a um, rising tide lifts all boats. So collective action is going to be in your favor. The other thing, and I touched on this earlier, is embrace your strengths. Embrace your strengths as a small country. And that is not with regard to your grapes, your land, your, you know, the, the, the people. It's actually around the characteristics that are unique to a small country. And those tend to be um, you're agile. So you can, you are in the process of building what is brand North Macedonia and you can adapt quickly to what you are hearing and learning from the market. And in fact, you can get a running start on this in a way that what I would describe as legacy, legacy brands um, can't because of the benefits of digital. So the second one is small countries tend to be extremely creative And they tend to be extremely creative problem solvers. And I think that if we look toward examples, New Zealand being one of them, this is one of the great strengths of being a cohesive organization working to build your brand on a global stage is that you are able to find ways that, you know what, frankly, just Napa would never be able to do it. So embrace your agility, embrace your creativity, embrace your ingenuity, and embrace your collaboration. From a growth and marketing standpoint, those are, those are the pillars upon which you would stand. Thanks. Robert, I think you wanted to add something. 
Um, yes, I, mean, I think I, it may seem as if I've been sounding negative and I didn't want that. My, my point about being if it was to try to say don't and following again what Polly is saying, don't follow other people. But I think we need to understand that it is not a simple thing launching a wine brand, a wine country, a wine region or a wine grape. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of competitors out there. And I think to move into some discussion of, of, of being digital that I think Polly uh, is going to be particularly um, expert on talking about, wow. what we need to do is to understand the variety of wines that we have to offer are going to please particular kinds of people. And the, the great thing about Macedonia, as Polly was saying, it's a small country, the volume of wine we have to sell is not that great for Macedonia. And if you look at the whole world of wine, the number of consumers there are across the world, and the way that distribution has developed in recent times, it's much easier today to potentially to get small volumes of wine from different producers to consumers in different countries. And I think the key is to use much more sophistication in finding the ways of actually targeting those people. And it's the thing that anybody who understands what Amazon has done with all its products, we need to start thinking about wine or Spotify with music. We need to think about wine in a much more um, digital, modern, targeted way than we have done in the times of supermarket selling. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we should um, regard a little bit uh, some parallels between Macedonia as a small country with two million people. New Zealand has five million people, is clearly bigger. In both countries, we have more sheep than human beings, and the sheep don't drink wine. <laughs> so what did uh, the wine sector, the wine industry in uh, New Zealand, to stress it again, Polly, what did they do so well that they were so successful on the markets? Yeah, I, I think that, so there are some systemic factors that we must take into account, which is New Zealand actually has much friendlier alcohol legislation along the supply chain than, for instance, the U.S. does. Um, and, and that certainly has an impact on our ability to service the domestic market. Um, we also have, uh, I would say, because you, you know, you remember it, it was only 4 million when I moved here and that was 20 years ago. It took us that long to grow. It is a very collegial, supportive um, community of winemakers. And that, I, I think that we really saw that this year because New Zealand was in the middle, um, actually they were just starting harvest when their very first lockdown happened. And the community as a whole had to pull together to figure out how were they going to overcome this problem? How are they going to communicate about it? So I, I think that in New Zealand, what it does come down to is very much a community spirit that is part and parcel of, of a, a small population. Um, now, I, I suppose, you know, some of it's also the right place at the right time. And I, I dare say that if they were starting that today, they would encounter far more challenges because markets that helped them grow early on are heavily saturated right now. So the reason that I bring this up and the way that I, I notice it applies to our clients um, is that it's very important that you begin with, and this is definitely true of digital marketing, that you begin your planning with what I would describe as realistic expectations. I think that there are a lot of people who look at digital or just like the wine industry has often looked at exporting as the panacea that's going to solve all of their problems. So you have to start with realistic expectations. And then another thing that hasn't come up so far that I think applies to some of the questions you've asked is every producer, every organization is going to have their own goals. And they need that needs to be stated from the beginning, because if your goal is to make a whole lot of money, you're going to make a very different choice than if your goal is to reestablish a heritage grape. So, you know, 
set goals, be realistic, work together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Robert? I think, I think the interesting thing, because I was around during those early days in New Zealand as it happens, New Zealand did something fascinating, which it had two, it was like a boxer with a left and a right hook. On the one hand, you had some very big companies, Montana being the one at the time um, uh, that was the, the big one, now Van Rock Station, which had large volumes of very nicely priced, easy to understand wines. Um, and then you had the Cloudy Bay and a few of the others who were the small, highly priced, as- aspirational brands that you had to queue up to get hold of. And both of these, uh, in, in a way, made New Zealand sexy because you had these expensive wines that got a good reputation and the wine that you could find in your supermarket. Every wine region and every grape that I know that has succeeded has succeeded because of some star producers. I agree with Polly and Tali that people need to work together and actually Cloudy Bay worked with Montana in those days very happily, but you do need the stars. So Priorat in Spain has become successful. There were about three or four producers that made Priorat. Ribera del Duero, the same thing, but there are a lot of other regions in Spain that no one's heard of, that nobody goes out to buy because there are no stars. The same applies even in Bordeaux. Margot has Chateau Margot and some, some, some great chateau. You go to Listrac or Moulis, the villages next to Margot. Very few people have gone into a shop and said, do you have anything from Moulis or Listrac? Uh, where I'm making wine in, in the south of France, Carignan. There are some wonderful wines made from Carignan, but not very many. Very few people have wanted to buy Carignan. And so I think we need to we need to find the stars and we need stars to have and with with, with Ranets, it's important to have the aspirations to make the hundred dollar Ranets. We need people to be making the hundred dollar Fetiaska Niagara in, in Moldova. We need that level of saying, how can we make one of the best wines in the world? Don't make value for money wine because everybody makes value for money wine. Mm-hmm. Make money that is, make wine that is worth a high price. Yeah. The main topic of our discussion today is digitalization of marketing, of course. But, uh, Polly, would you agree that digitalization, of course, it's very important, but it's just one pillar of a holistic strategy to move forwards? Of course, it is a pillar with growing importance. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's one of the things that we go out and preach all the time is that the day of calling something digital marketing is gone. It's just marketing. One of the biggest issues that we see with wineries around the world is that they've siloed digital and that they don't actually understand digital as a foundation of strategy, that, that we don't just talk on social media and you don't just throw an ad up and you don't just boost something and you don't just send out an email, but that actually these are part of a holistic approach to growing your business. Um, And, you know, the other thing that I I just can't stress enough about that is that people have this perception of digital, um, uh, that it's about the the shiny parts. It's about the pretty things. You know, it's about having a beautiful website and it's about having a beautiful Instagram feed when actually the function of digital besides communication and looking great is to acquire data about our audience so that we can provide what they want. We can speak to the market. You know, we, we always say it's the right message to the right people at the right time. Um, and, and that is what, that's what a good digital strategy provides. And I, I can absolutely just tell you from the number of wineries we talk to year on year that wineries, a lot of wineries turn it down. And the wineries who approach it methodically and mindfully see results. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next question goes to both of you. Uh, should the wineries hire more now hire more IT and uh, database experts or train and develop their existing sales force? Maybe Robert, you start. Uh, well, I think it's a dangerous question because how do, and Polly, I'm sure will have different answers. It depends on how you define those people. So it depends. A salesman, I mean, there are all sorts of kinds of salesmen, and a great salesman can sell anything in any way to anyone. And he 
can do it digitally and he can do it knocking on a door and, and standing there. Um, but if you're just, if sales is, and unfortunately sometimes it is, is give me the product, I'll sell it. Very often salesmen are not very good at building brands. They're not very good at building long-term, some of them, long-term relationships. If they hit their budget for this week or this month, they're often quite happy. They're not necessarily the best long-term salesmen, but they may be quite good salesmen in terms of, of uh, volume selling. Um, in terms of IT, you also need people in the IT world who understand the, the, the complexity of wine. Wine is not exactly the same as selling loaves of bread or selling shoes. And so just uh, um, uh, Polly and I have been talking today to a, to a client about this very sort of question. Um, you know, you've got people who will sell themselves as being, oh, I'm very good at, at doing, uh, web, uh, doing websites, for example. I've done websites for, for banks or shoe companies. Well, is that necessarily what a wine company is going to need? So I don't think it's, there's a, an answer of this or that. I think it's the best of this or the best of that. That's a, probably a cowardly answer, but um, Polly, you may have a different way of looking at it. Yeah, yeah so it, it's funny because I'm the digital marketer who talks less about digital marketing than pretty much any of my competitors. The best person to hire is the person who is the advocate for your customers, hmm. whether it's because they come from a psychology background. I mean, they could have been anything, HR, they could have been a teacher, they could have been a mom, they're an empath. I don't care what it is. If they can actually get to the heart of your customer base, they are your biggest asset. Because if you can tap into that, then sales, which is not the same as marketing, they share a sphere, but they're not the same thing. You know, the thing that salesmen do is they walk into a room and they get the lay of the land really fast and they know how to talk to the person who's in front of them. That is something that digital allows us to do now where IT comes into it. So I at Five Forest has a full tech team that, that sits behind me and they never get to be on the screen like this. You know, they, um, they have had to learn wine. And they've had to learn the intricacies of wine. So that, that is absolutely pertinent to what Robert has said. But more importantly, they are a part of a, a part of a working team. So their mandate is not build this thing and go away. It's actually build the thing so that we can acquire the data so that we can test A, B tests, so we can optimize, so we can improve. It, it, it should never live in a bubble in such a way that you can say, we hire this person to just do this and we hire this person to just do this. It's, it's cohesive. Mm -hmm. Yes, Robert. Robert? Yeah. I, think that, I think the point that Polly's making there I think is crucial, which is the wine industry has not been good at communication. It's relied on people like you and me, Thomas, as journalists to do a lot of its communicating for it. And it's also been much better at broadcasting not listening. I make the wine my father made, my grandfather made. I make the wine that my accountant told me to make. I make the wine that the marketing people. And it's actually listening to what the consumer wants has not been our skill. As Polly said, that's what digital is all about. That's what social media allows us to do. Uh, but not just that, all the whole broad issue of digital actually says that we are standing in a bar actually listening to all those conversations and understanding what those people in that bar want to drink rather yeah. than saying, oh, I've just brought in some strawberry beer. Everybody drinks strawberry beer. Maybe they don't want strawberry beer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I just want to I want to touch on that for a minute. So, um, you know, I, I think that wine has a, a contentious relationship with marketing. And that is unfortunate because marketing is not anathema. You know, we always say that good digital makes our audience more human, not less. It makes us more empathetic, more compassionate. We're able to actually speak to their purpose in engaging with our brand. So I think that if we're kind of backing up to square one, one of the things that anyone, so whether it's, um, whether it's a region, whether it's individual producers, that they need to dispel right away is this notion of simply marketing being bad or a sellout or something that only industrial wines do or all of these, you know, preconceived notions around what wine marketers do. 
Mm-hmm. Shifting back a little bit uh, to Macedonia and the Balkan countries, what would you say, um, which would be the homework, the first homeworks countries uh, like Macedonia and surrounding countries and the wineries, what would they have to do to be able to build up international marketing from the very start from scratch? Can you give any advice? Who are you asking? Mm -hmm. Robert, this time. That one's all yours, Robert. Um, I think, and I'm, I'm kind of repeating myself, but I'm trying to avoid that. It's actually understand, saying, right, what have we got? What is our strength? This is what Polly was saying. Yeah. I think Macedonia, Vranets is a grape that essentially one or two other places have it, but it is Macedonia's strength. There isn't very much in the world, and Macedonia's got most of it. It has a character. It doesn't taste like Merlot or Pinot Noir or Cabernet Sauvignon. That's interesting. Now we have to say, how much have we got? Where do you think it's going to fit in the world? To me, it's like a, a piece of a puzzle, of, of, a, of um, a jigsaw puzzle. Where does it fit? It's going to fit into restaurants. We need to work out how we talk to the sort of people in the right kind of restaurants. And the restaurants that only sell French wine or French food or Italian food, maybe they're not going to be relevant, but there are sommeliers all over the world who are becoming some of the greatest Uh, advocates and ambassadors for wine. That's not digital, but actually it is because those people are being, are reading and are being accessed very much through the digital world. Then we look at the retail business. I don't think we say we're going to go to one country or another country. In my wine, so I'm producing 3.7 million bottles of wine. I'm British. I'm producing it in France. I sell more wine in Vietnam and Cambodia than I do in Britain because I found the right people in Vietnam and Cambodia who wanted to buy the kind of wine I'm making in France. Now that wasn't, I didn't know that would happen. I sell my wine in some very good restaurants in the UK. It just happened that I could find the right people. So to me, it is that key. And it's, as I said, it's a slight repetition, but I'm not going to apologize for this. In a very large world, we need to find in each market, the people who have got the openness. And it's going to be true in terms of those people are going to travel in different ways. They're eating different food. The people who are queuing up to eat McDonald's and are buying uh, barefoot uh, Merlot today are probably not going to be the people who are going to buy Vranets tomorrow. But we don't, really? need, <laughs> we don't need them to buy Vranets because we don't have enough Vranets to satisfy those people if they all wanted to buy it. Yeah. We want Holly, you want to add something? Yeah, yeah, I want to add something to that. So okay. I, I really agree with that. But I think that what Robert has also hinted at has to do with um, a aligning yourself with the right partners. And something that I notice, and I see this a lot in New Zealand, and I hope my New Zealanders don't hear me say this. I've seen a lot of independent brands except the first um, in importer who's knocked on their door. And they're like, yes, I'm so excited. That person's told me that they're going to get me into America. And, you know, like they don't say, is this person the right person to be representing my brand? How do I fit in their portfolio? How are they going to communicate about me? How are they going to represent me? Because remember what you are actually doing is you are hiring the person who now is the next step sitting between you and the customer. So I, I would just strongly recommend, you know, identifying for every individual producer, what are your values and make certain that when you are finding the right distribution partners, that they are people who are in alignment with that and can go forward and actually communicate your brand as close as possible to the way you would if you were standing in the fancy wine store in New York trying to get that placement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. And I think that also listening to those people is crucial. So my distributor in Russia is Simple. They're one of the biggest and best in Russia. My distributor in America is Prestige, similarly. What they tell me about my wines is very different. Now we don't make different, uh, we don't need different examples of the same wine for Russia and America, but Russia will buy different wines, different examples to what America buys. And sometimes the Russians say, can we have a different label? And it's not for us to say, no, This is my label you like. No, actually, if you're going to sell my wine to people who are going to enjoy my wine, you're very welcome. We will adapt our label, not in a way that 
that actually goes against our values and our character. But we will work with you in Russia or with you, our importer in India, or you, our importer in, in America, to, to actually make it easier for you to sell our wine. And the same applies to communications. The website, for example, I think, again, Polly can talk more about this. The idea of having one website that the entire world sees that may or may not be badly translated is may not be the best way of promoting your what you do. I, I uh -huh. will I will give you some praise because Robert said that. You know, I went through and I looked at an awful lot of North Macedonian winery websites um, in preparation for this, and I didn't find any that were really badly translated. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Very true. Yeah. yeah. Robert, you, you mentioned countries like Turkey before and Greece. And uh, indeed, uh, as we all know, there's very, very good wines produced in these countries. But if you try to pronounce uh, Turkish wine like Öküz Gözü or Kalecik Karase, will be very difficult for many people. Or reading labels in Greek letters as well. <laughs> I think so. Uh, in this position, I think uh, Macedonia with Vranets is in a better position, or am I wrong? It's in a better position, but can I just <clears throat> tell you that I have Viognier. That's not difficult, is it? Viognier difficult? Yeah, it is. I can tell you in America, Viognier, people look at it, they go, Viogna. Yeah, mm -hmm. they don't know. And actually, the simpler you can make it, the better it's going to be. But actually, are people going to be asking for Vranets, or are they going to be asking for a brand of Vranets? To me, uh, I know this is Vranets Day, and I've been involved in Grenache Day and various other days. Ultimately, it is going to be the brand that people see. And then the Vranets is the style within that. But make the purchasing process easy for them. If you're in a part of the world where Vranets is easy to pronounce and easy to see immediately, yes. But it may well be that when you're in America, it may be that you need to make the label, everything about it, a very easy to purchase uh, if you're going to be so particularly in a place where people are going to have to ask for it but bear in mind in retail environment they may not have to ask for it they may just be picking it up from the shelf mm -hmm. but pronunciation does matter Gewurztraminer <laughs> doesn't worry any professional yeah, yeah. either 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 me as a german <laughs> but consumers outside germany have a problem yeah, i know um, Polly, so you wanted I, to add something. I, I just want to I want to add something that is really specific to digital that I think is not something that wine tends to think about. Um, let's not make arbitrary decisions. It's really easy to test these things. And so to explain that, I'm going to tell one of my very favorite stories. Um, there is an American podcaster by the name of Tim Ferriss, who is one of the top podcasters in the world. And he's also a writer. And his, his first book that sort of launched him to fame in the book world was called The Four-Hour Workweek. The way that he decided what to name something is that he spent $500 to run a Google test ad that went nowhere. And he just said there were two versions and which one got the most clicks. It's these simple kind of things that digital can allow us to do. So I've seen multiple spellings of Renets in preparation for this. Mm -hmm. So, okay, what mm -hmm. spelling, what pronunciation? What can we get by with? Like, actually, instead of us just sitting around a boardroom trying to figure out what people are going to like, let's just figure out a way to ask them. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the other thing that I want to say, just, just to be conscious of the state of the world right now, is that I think we do need to make changes with caution and with care. Because right now is a time when I think that to go out and to change native language to accommodate uh, another market has the potential to get you into some trouble. Mm -hmm. So we can't, we can't not yeah. acknowledge that. Shifting slightly towards yes, the Robert. end of our discussion, um, I would like to stress uh, another topic. Um, we have been talking about the holistic approach in marketing, e-sales, uh, digitalization is very important, but is not the whole picture, of course. Which future importance do you see uh, for the classical communication channels like Pressworks, PR, trade shows, competitions? 
doesn't digital market, marketing need a good story as well behind the product, which needs to be told somehow? Holly? Well, I have my own bias. So of course, I'm going to say own all of your channels of communication if you can, because that's what digital allows you to do. Now, that having been said, I work with wineries who have tremendous PR teams backing them. And that makes a difference. Um, the problem is that a lot of times, I think that wineries and just small businesses, independent businesses in general, um, can't often afford to do all of the above. So they have to figure out where does their money go. And the, the, the reason that I, I mean, Five Forest does more than just digital, but the reason that we focus on digital is because digital can track every dollar that a client spends from moment it goes out until the moment it returns. And you can't get that with most of the traditional methods of communication. Um, I'll tell you a great place to spend your money. If you want to look toward traditional marketing, number one, you know what? Good photography and good video go a long way toward many, uh, many channels of communication. Another one is a good copywriter. Hire someone to write that story for you. Don't try to do it yourself because we can never tell our own story in a compelling fashion. These are, these are investments that service both, both pathways of marketing. And that, that's where I would look at spending money. Yeah, Robert, please. So uh, Polly and I, we work in a project, which I think is a good example of how you can link digital and um, analog together. So for example, for a client uh, in France, we're producing a cookbook um, by the family, that the, the, the favorite recipes for the family that owns the, 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 the estate there will be a, a physical book they can give that to journalists to distributors they can sell it they can do what they like but there's also going to be an ebook version and the ebook version means that they can distribute that easily but within the ebook people will be able to click and link back to the winery and the winery will be able to communicate with them now is that a digital uh, effort or is that uh, an analog effort now the pictures in the book uh, they'll be on the walls of the estate and they'll be nice and so on, but they could also be on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So I think that now what I'd be saying is whatever level of your sophistication, you should be looking just as when you look at a piece of uh, meat and you think, am I going to cook this all today? Am I going to cook some today and have some in a sandwich tomorrow? What am I going to do with it? Anything we have, any story we have, any product we have, we should be looking at it broadly and saying, I can talk to this journalist in this way. I can put it in front of a consumer in that way, and I can do all sorts of things with it, not just, oh, I've got it, I put an advertisement, or I show it to one journalist, or I do one tasting. Those days are over. And I think Polly is, is making, I think, a crucial point, which is that historically, the wine industry was very good. Unfortunately, it didn't have very much money. And unfortunately, the system, uh, the margins in wine are far worse than in spirits and indeed in beer. We don't have enough money to spend on marketing, and then we spend it quite badly. And because we spend it quite badly, we don't get the, the money we should be getting to be able to pay for better marketing. So to me, the, the thing I would say, and I wouldn't have said this as a consumer journalist, because I was always looking for the cheapest, best wine I could find for my readers. But now as a business journalist, I'm saying to the producers, how can you justify a higher price for your wine? You have to make the wine good enough to justify that price, obviously. But once you've made that wine and you've got that price, you need to be able to persuade people to buy that wine at that price that keeps the circle going and that enables you to go on making that wine as well as you want to make it. Because the moment you're selling wine cheaply, as a lot of people watching this may know, you may have to cut corners in the vineyard or in the winery. Um, so I, I know that we we want to have Q&A, but um, Robert has introduced something that I think is if if there's one lesson that I have just learned the hard way through working with so many wineries is that if you are in a space where you are just going into a market, you are just making early decisions, please, dear heavens, do a business plan, model your business make certain that you're charging the right amount, 
have a plan because a lot of the reason that people can't afford to hire a marketer is because they never actually priced their product right to begin with. They never factored in all of the cost of marketing because historically, if you look at, at the three tier system, this was not a part of their responsibility, but now it is. Who pays for the Instagram accounts? Who pays for the, the MailChimp and the emails and, and the tech and the hosting and the website and all of this? Your distro is not paying for it. Your importer is not paying for it you're paying for it. You've got to make certain that you actually have the money factored into every one of those bottles to pay for everything that we've talked about today. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the last point before we move to Q&A. Um, we have all seen that the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has created a real boost in e-sales, in e-commerce, in many, many uh, different branches. I mean, textile or books are far, far above the wine industry for many years already. We are still uh, in in uh, one digital in in one digit ranges. What concerns that um, is this moment right now with uh, the the pandemic? Isn't it the right moment now to say for the wine industry uh, we will follow the example of other ones and take the chance? What would you say? Polly? Need to have a go at that one. Yeah. Yep. All right. <laughs> I've been saying for a long time that this is a war of attrition. This has been coming. And my take with all the conversations and work that we've done since COVID struck is that actually what we're seeing right now is a stratification of the wineries whose leaders are willing to adapt to change and the ones who simply cannot do it. The level of mergers and acquisitions within the wine industry right now is just over the top because there are going to be brands who cannot adapt. So I don't think it's a matter of will people change? I think it's a matter of the only people left standing are going to be the ones who have changed. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, I've just been literally just before this conversation, I was talking to my partner about our sales in the US and uh, the information from the US is potentially very encouraging or depressing, depending who you are. If you're a big, strong brand, you will have sold more wine in the US this year than you did last year. If you're a small brand, you have had a bad time this year. Um, so and if you're a very small but agile brand, and you've actually got out there and you found your customers, you may have done very well. But if you're a small brand and you haven't made the effort, it has not been a good time. So to me, this is, you, you cannot today sit back and say, um, I make good wine, my price is nice, my label is nice, come and get it. Uh, what I always say to people is if you've done those three things, all you have done is get a ticket to start running in the marathon because there are thousands and thousands and thousands of other people who've made good wine at a good price with a good label. You have to do, and back to Renets, I think one of the things, because it is Renets Day, you have got a point of difference because there are only 90, whatever it is, million bottles or whatever liters of it. That is one of the things that sets you apart on that run in that marathon. But it's still, you've still got to run the race. Well, Robert, perfect final words, I would say. I don't know what I should add to that. And I would uh, give the floor to Elena now, who has collected some questions, please. I can't hear you, Elena. Hearing me now? Yes, yes now it's good. Yeah. So I will start from question and answer uh, button. So we have a great uh, greetings from uh, Montenegro. And the question is, uh, by your opinion, what will change in marketing after COVID? So this question is to both of you. Robert, Maybe you should ask. Well, I think the thing that we're doing now is the most obvious thing. You know, the fact that uh, we're having these conversations on Zoom, people are not going to travel as much as they did. That, I think, is, a, is an obvious fact. Uh, we relied on journalists going everywhere and sending bottles and so on. There's going to be so much of this that's going to happen. And we are going to actually be arguably listening more because we can. You can have, you can do 10 Zooms in a day and you could be talking to China or you could be talking to anywhere in the world. So I think communication is going to change radically. And that also is going to change, hopefully, the way in which we as producers 
actually look at the world because if we're listening to our Chinese person this morning and our Russian customer this afternoon, maybe we'll understand better how we supply those people than before when we did made one visit a year to those countries and maybe had them on the phone. Thank you, Robert. Uh, the last question for exotic wine travel, they have few questions here, but I will start from the last one because it's very interesting. Uh, do you think small countries like Macedonia should go out and market themselves? Or do you think it would be better served if several of these small countries in the region go out together, for example, Macedonia, Serbia, Montenegro, Bulgaria, Bosnia, and so on? That's the Balkan approach. Yes. <laughs> Polly, Polly, do you want to answer that? I've got my own answer. Yeah. Go first, so so um, I, as I said earlier, I'm a big fan of owning your own properties. And I don't think anyone is ever going to tell your story as well as you are. So while there are certainly benefits of that sort of block action, I'm, I'm saying you go for it as an individual country. And you know what? Set an example for all of those other countries. I agree. I go worse than that. And this is probably not what you want to hear at Wines of Macedonia, but I will say it. I go brand first then region, then country, because all of the successful regions in the world have become successful because of some producers. We know about the village of Margot because of Chateau Margot. We know about Priorat because of the producers there. You will be doing more of a service to your region by becoming a success from your region than actually linking arms with everybody else and marching together. And unfortunately, when you do that, and I shouldn't say this, the slowest person in that uh, parade pulls everyone back. So I, 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 I may, if, if I may just add one thing, I also think, well, I'm the moderator, but I can give you my, my opinion in, in, in that case as well. I think if the Balkan countries would uh, stick together and try to market themselves outside together, it will be very, very difficult to get a profile, exactly. profile which is which is different to any other things. Of course, you would have more marketing power, but especially in terms of profile, I see that very, very critically. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question, uh, Robert already uh, answered it, but uh, I, will, uh, I will read it publicly because we are going live on Facebook, so the people over there are not uh, reading all these things in the chat. So is it possible like a marketing strategy to spread Branets uh, as, a, as a variety in the EU vineyards? For example, to have more vineyards with Branets in France, Italy or Spain, uh, so the great variety to become international. So Robert, you already answered well, this. I answered, I'll answer it now. A, a, in Europe, it's very hard because you have appellation rules that make it quite hard to grow new varieties. But in fact, if you can make your grape variety appealing, uh, to Americans, to Australians, to New Zealanders, then you can actually make a success. But it's an example, for example, the Pinotage from South Africa is a failure because essentially outside South Africa, very few people thought it was interesting enough to plant. So you need to actually have a grape that is appealing enough for all those places. Okay, Polly, you will add something to this? No, I'm going to trust Robert's judgment on that one. Okay, I have no question only for you. It's uh, for our friends from Singapore. Uh, so the question is only for Polly, something closer to home to, for you. How do you position New Zealand wine to South uh, Asian markets? Southeast Asian well, markets, sorry. Well, I'm, I'm going to give an answer that my friend Robert Joseph gave me a very long time ago when we had this conversation, um, which is, and I would really like for him to jump in on this. I think that there's, um, maybe it's naivete, maybe it's because we're only 5 million people in a whole country, but I, I think that we need to micro target. I don't care where you're going. If you're going into the US, if you're going into Southeast Asia, if you're going into the UK, you know, with the, the days of that kind of like, wide net and hoping to catch some fish are gone. Identify the spaces. So, and this is so true in, in any Asian regions where we have heavily, you know, dense populations. Identify micro 
niche areas where you feel that you have the best chance either through partnership or through position to get a hold in that market and then grow from there. Don't try to don't try to go into a whole country anymore ever. Uh, don't go into a whole region, you know, and, and Robert, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, I'll say one thing a big that I bugaboo of yours. one of the things that I hate when I'm in, in China, for example, is people say, ah, oh, my wine goes perfectly with Chinese food. <laughs> it doesn't. Good, the good reason joke. I know it, that whatever it is, it doesn't because there's no such thing as Chinese food. Each Chinese meal has a large number of different things. If it goes with this thing, it doesn't go with that thing. Um, we need to start thinking beyond the old ways. Mm -hmm. Telling the story of how your family had a castle from a long time ago may work with some people. It doesn't work with other people. Georgia has done incredibly well in China because of being ancient. In America, when you say we've been going for 8,000 years, it doesn't have nearly the same resonance as it does in Shanghai and Beijing. So we need to understand what each place wants. And in places like Asia, actually having a history has huge value that it doesn't necessarily in some of the Anglo-Saxon places. Thank you, Robert. The next question from Exotic Wine Travelers uh, again. Thank you for following us the whole day, uh, Matthew and Kerry. You sales and bailment a thing in the wine industry such that the marketing's objective is to enable the salespeople and create a synergy between message and execution. Polly. Okay, repeat that for me. It's in the chat, by the way. Yeah, you have it is in the chat? Yeah. yeah. Okay, just getting that. Sorry, when I'm doing this off my phone, unfortunately, uh, today. Is sales enablement a thing in the wine? Oh, industry? yes, I saw this one come through. Is, is, um, I guess I would have to get some clarification. Robert, sales enablement. What specifically does that mean? Well, I didn't ask the question. If Matthew. I know, but you know it, more than I do. So I trust it, you. What, what exactly do we mean for sales enablement? Well, I'm presuming. Well, actually, come, uh, they're there. So exactly. Why, would you like yeah. to, rather than us trying to make that. Just let so, them hop in. Yeah. Okay. I will connect. They're in the chat. I hope they're listening. They can. Exotic wine yeah, yeah. It's a corporate function. Keep going. Say more. Uh, do you uh, want? Are you talking about enabling people to buy or enabling people are, to sell? Which, what, where is? Or are you talking about incentive? What we would call incentivizing. Enabling Come on in. Enabling. Um. So like enabling your distributors, possibly through incentivizing their sales or- Or is um, it private? Is it selling, is it private people selling to each other? Marketing people enabling salespeople to sell within the country or within the company. Um, okay, so I mean, I guess I, I'm probably not going to answer this in the way that you want, but let me give you my best answer working with wineries that have, um, have both sales and marketing teams. So I always equate it to like the open office where you should have sales on that side and marketing on this side, but actually there's, you're all hearing each other's conversations because your sales team is on the front lines. They're actually the person who are collecting feedback from everyone that they're talking to about the wines. They need to bring that feedback back to marketing because marketing needs to understand that to adapt their strategies. At the same time, marketing needs to be communicating with sales to help them have, again, realistic expectations, understand what the goals are, driving toward the same, what I would say, set of corporate values and communication. Because I, I'm not saying that every salesperson can do this, but we've all heard stories of, of um, I'm not getting this right, we've all heard stories of the salespeople who have completely gone off and, and for want of a better word, damaged brands because of how they how they spoke about it i'm sorry that i don't know specifically what you're talking about i will look that up okay, but can i just yeah. also say something speaking as somebody who's involved with with mining wine business international which i'm 
totally biased about, but I think it's a good magazine. But one of the things that bothers me when I meet readers is very often they only read the part of the magazine that applies to their country and what they do. And so, you know, I, the people who make wine, in, in, as it might be Moldova or Georgia, don't necessarily read about what's happening in Chile or in New Zealand. And when they're talking to journalists, they're very in interested in talking to the journalist about what we do. They're not necessarily asking the journalist where that journalist has been and what else they've seen. And to me, I think the wine industry has got so much to learn from what's happening elsewhere. So many countries already moving. So for example, Amazon in Japan has sommeliers who answer the phone and give people advice on what food to have with what to eat. Nobody outside Japan knows about that, but it, it's already happening. But we'll sure as anything, somebody will adapt it. So I think you as producers spend much more time reading and listening mm -hmm. and finding out what's happening elsewhere because you will learn a lot. I hope they're not leaving because I actually want to answer their question really quickly. Because while Robert was talking, I went in and looked up sales enablement to know specifically what they were talking about. Green perfect clip. Okay. Okay. So sales enablement is for marketing. This is my understanding marketing to provide the resources necessary to enable sales to do their job. The reason I'd never heard this language is yeah. Like how do they do it? If, if we haven't given it's them the resource and I think it's what you do. I think in wine where it becomes an issue. And this is where I think I, where I would like to answer your question is that actually a lot of wineries, their marketing and communications team do not provide say the retail front lines. They don't provide the non in-house sales team with the resources necessary. Yeah. And sometimes that can mean documentation, text sheets, all that kind of stuff. Sometimes it could be video training. Sometimes it could be, um, um, you know, storytelling, sometimes it could be all the ways that we empower the person who's standing in the retail shop in the middle of Ohio to talk about our wines. And that is an area that almost every winery I encounter could do better at. And digitally, just even having this comes up all the time, journalists go in, retailers go in to try to find something on a site and can't find it. Can I just answer Rados? Yeah. There's a question from Rados uh, in the okay. here. Shell Macedonia and Montenegro and Kosovo Wine Associations built joint strategy to promote Granites. We kind of answered that, but what I would say would be interesting is yes, do tastings. Do tastings of Granites from different countries, certainly. And I did this with, um, for example, Saparavi in, in Shanghai, with Saparavi from Georgia and other countries, from, including Australia and, and indeed, I think, New Zealand. So, yes, do that. And maybe Granites versus other grapes. What, what other grapes are like Vranets, but uh, what, which grape would be a way in to understand Vranets? We could look at Italian grapes, we could look at Malbec from France, or some various areas that, that, could, that actually create a road to Vranets. And do we have any more questions, Elena? Just at the moment, I have one quick, but yes, this is a, okay. We don't have any question before we go, uh, uh, before we, 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 we close actually this panel, I want to use this opportunity because we don't have an official ceremony this, uh, this year. Uh, and we are announcing a brand as ambassadors. So I will make a share on my screen. Oh, yes. So I know that guy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I wanted to be a, uh, actually a surprise. Uh, uh, it you. is, it yes. is, it is, Elena. Thank you very much. So, yes, uh, uh, we, I mean, uh, in the name, on behalf of uh, the Association Wines of Macedonia, we want to thank you for uh, uh, for helping us and for putting all of your efforts for all regional countries, not only for Macedonia. But in the last two years, we were workly, uh, we worked actually with, with you very close and uh, we want to give you this recognition. So this, uh, actually this pin, I will send you via uh, extra. So, really? so I, don't, I, I don't have to come now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much. That's very kind. Thank you. And uh, just before we close, I want to announce our next uh, panel sessions to the end of the day. 
So from 5.30, uh, we are going live uh, also on uh, Zoom and Facebook. Uh, wine trade under Corona and challenges for sale wines from local grape varieties on international markets. We have uh, uh, as a moderator, uh, Peter McCombi, uh, a master of wine, and uh, he will discussing the topic together with uh, Paul Robert Bloom. Uh, who is uh, importing Branet's uh, wines from the region for almost 40 years. And we have also Steve Daniel, a head buying uh, at Hall Garden from UK. Uh, and uh, from 7 p.m. Uh, Central uh, European time, uh, we will have Caroline Gilby. Uh, she, will, uh, she will present uh, the Macedonia as a wine country. Uh, she will talk about the Vranets and she will also taste a uh, few Vranets uh, wines from different styles, stainless steel, aged, and also uh, some blends with Vranets. So and may I, may I also just have one final word? I want to say thank you very, very much uh, to my two co panelists. A very special thank you goes to Polly, of course, because I know how late it is now <laughs> in New Zealand. And I already wish you a very good night afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you, bye Elena. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Bye. Bye.